Today, we're gonna go through one spot. Doesn't sound all that fancy, doesn't sound all that interesting, but it's gonna take us almost an hour. Especially if I go slowly and I quiz all of you along the way. We're gonna be discussing a scenario, very specifically, where? 60 big blinds deep. Where? The low jack raises, which is under the gun six-handed. And you call on the button, or they raise, you call, you raise, they call, whatever. We're gonna look at both spots. And we're gonna look at how to play this interesting scenario from out of position, okay? While all of you are trickling in, I wanna say hello, happy Monday. We're giving away two seats to the $50,000 added ladies tournaments happening at the lodge coming up out of my own pocket because I'm happy to support all sorts of inclusive in the poker community. And I think it's a good thing to have a $50,000 added tournament that Bill Perkins is just throwing in. He wants his Ira Zero. Might as well give it away. So I figure, you know, $50,000 and $1,000. 50000 of his dollars may be equi equivalent to $1,000 of my dollars. I think he has 50 times as much money as me. Maybe more. Well, I'm happy to give $1,000 to the ladies' tournament. Get in there. Have fun. Any World Series poker meetups? Yes, we are having breakfast. That will be taking place on day 1D. For poker coaching members, send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com if you want to get on the list. If you're here and you're a poker coaching member, you're going to get priority. Monkey Mai says, so, low jack versus button, 60 big blind, single raise pot then today. That is correct. That's exactly what we're going through. Let's get right to it. Today, we are playing. We're low jack raises, button calls, 60 big blinds deep, Okay. You all see what the spot is? Maybe I should move this down slightly. Eh. It says the spot up here. No, we'll just do like this. This is fine. You're gonna have to pay attention. You have to pay attention a little bit. What does SRP mean? It means single raise pot compared to a three bet pot, right? Mm, I guess here's where we need to be. Okay. So in this scenario, low jack raises, button calls. Low Jack is out of position on the flop. They raise with all these hands in green or red. Look, I hear people who are colorblind cannot tell the difference between green, green and red. That is not good. I don't know how to change the colors on Pio Solver. This is what we got. We got green and red. We gave the solver a bunch of different bet size options. We let it run for a little while. Run, we let it run for a little while. This may not be 100% precise, but it's going to be very, very close. This is a situation where we have lots of bet sizes. I want to make it very clear here. The pot is 6.9 big blinds. That's how much we, ra we raise the opponent called, right? This would be one for the big blind ante, 0. 0.5 for the, got the calculator to show all this very clearly. We have 6.9 big blind pot, 6.9 minus the one big blind ante minus the big blind minus the small blind equals 4.4, right? So that means we raise to 2.2 big blinds preflop, 60 big blinds deep, and the button calls. Just put a decimal right here. See how it says pot is 669? It's actually 6.9 big blinds. A stacks remaining are 57.8, which makes sense, right? Because you raised to 2.2. So we have 57.8 big blinds behind. Over here, here are our bet size options. This is how you read Pio Solver. Call this a quick crash course. We have bet 578. That means 57.8 big blinds. All in. Probably don't want to use that option. It happens 0.78% of the time. Probably never. Here we have bet 90. That means bet nine big blinds, 1.3x pot or so. We have bet 6.9 big blinds, this is pot. We have bet one, uh, 41, big, or 41, which is 4.1 big blinds, which is two thirds pot, 60% pot. Then we have bet 17, which is 1.7 big blinds, which is definitely gonna be your most frequent bet in the scenario, especially out of position. And then we have check, you all know what check is. We see in this scenario, you do a lot of checking. Why are we doing a lot of checking on queen, six, four? Well, from out of position in general, in pretty much all scenarios, you are going to be checking with some portion of all hands on basically all boards. Now, why are you doing that? It's because when you raise and someone in position calls, the ranges are gonna be somewhere near 50-50 my range against their range. Even though I have aces and kings and queens and they do not, 
And that's because they're going to three bet their aces, kings, and queens, right? The problem is, is they're not calling raises with hands in this region, right? I mean, we're going to see that in just a second. They're going to have a lot more of a reasonable range. And reasonable ranges are connected with most boards pretty well. And we're going to end up with a lot of junk. We actually see here, our EV is 33.13. Let's get our little calculator here. Pot's uh, 69, right? So 33.13 divided by 69 equals. That means we own 48% of this pot. or We have 48% equity in this pot. Okay? 48% equity, which means we're going to do a lot of checking. If you have like 57% equity, then you can start betting a lot, but you're almost never going to have 57% equity out of position. It's just not going to happen. Okay? So this is a spot where we must do a lot of checking. Whenever we have something like 50-ish percent equity or less, we're going to do a ton of checking. Here we have 48. You show equity for each ranges under range explorer. It says right here. What are you asking? I'm not sure what you're asking me to show. I will make it clear. I'm okay with Pio. I'm not the Pio expert at all. Okay. In this scenario, let's take a look at how we're going to play on various spots. So let's say we check. Say we do check. How often, use your brain here. Take a second. Think about this. How often should the button be betting if we check? Well, if we check. If the low jack checks. Low jack check first act. How often should the button be checking if low jack checks? What do you think? Also worth noting, whenever you see a solver output that has mostly small bets being used, it's perfectly fine to use mostly small bets. Like I'm, I'm basically never going to be potting it or bigger in this spot. I think that's going to be a pretty easy implementable strategy. If you were to rerun this in a solver, you could rerun this and see that the spots, um, the spots are like, like your EV is roughly the same in this scenario. If you don't use the big bet sizes, it's going to make your strategy way easier. And it's just mostly going to use these two bets, right? Hey, Justin, longtime fan. Who's Justin? My name's Jonathan. Good morning. Louis Philippe, who runs the Poker Coaching Study Session, says 50-50. Woo! It's a broad, broad proclamation to claim 50-50. It's going to be something like that. Math is hard for you. Is it possible to play high stakes? I don't think you have to necessarily do math at the table so much. You just have to know the math that comes from most common spots. You do need to learn how to divide and multiply and add and subtract. That's all you really need to do. Divide, multiply, add, and subtract. That takes some practice. That takes some effort. If you've never added or multiplied or divided or subtracted. Subtracted? I guess that's a word. If you've never done those things, then, well, you may have a problem. But you need to practice. You can buy a third, fourth, fifth grade math book and get to work. Let's take a look at what we do. Okay, so let's say we check. So what you do in the solver here is you click check. And now it shows roughly how often each hand will use each action. Now, we just saw that against the opponent's range, we had a uh, 52% equity. Look what happens though, interestingly enough, whenever the opponent checks against this range, we're actually not in that great a shape because the opponent's gonna be checking with a decently protected range. That's kind of cool to see. When we are not heavily favored, I mean, we're ahead. I'm sorry. What am I saying? I'm saying the wrong thing. We're ahead and we're ahead even slightly more now. We have slightly more EV because the opponent checked. My brain's not working. Um, when we have the range advantage, but we don't have the nut advantage. I was thinking the pot was 80 for some silly reason, not 70. When we have the range advantage, but not the nut advantage, we're going to be betting somewhat frequently, but small. That's how it goes. Now I may say, do we have the nut advantage? We certainly have some sets. We have sixes and fours. But notice we're missing some ace queens. We're missing some king queens. We're missing some queen jacks, right? These are all pretty strong hands here. We're also missing aces and kings. If we go back to the opponent's strategy, you see they're going to check with aces sometimes. We're going to check the kings sometimes. We're going to check the queens and the ace queen and the king queen, right? So the we, we, well, we, I keep saying we, the low jack has the nut advantage in this scenario, but they don't really have the range advantage. It shows the range explorer under where it says check, under where it says check, range explorer. Why would you like to see this? You want to see the percentage of each hand we have in our range? I mean, I guess we can do that. Where do you want us to go from here? You lead the way if you want. Notice over here, this says the percentage of hands that each... Um, this, this shows 
how many combinations of each hand you have in your range and what percentage of hands you have in your range, right? Well, you can also see the equity of each specific hand, but notice some hands that are really high equity, like aces, kings, and queens, and ace, queen, and king, queen, whatever, are checking a lot, right? And that's to protect the weaker portions of your range. So notice you're also checking a lot of the trashy hands. And also, I suppose you can click in position range. Eh, no, you can't do that. Your biggest character leak. Do you believe in this strategy? You don't need to believe in math, fortunately. It just, it just is. Um, so anyway, you see we have a lot of uh, ace high, king high, queen high. That's a problem. Well, ace high, king, ace high, king high, and junk, which is a problem, right? Whenever you have a lot of ace high, king high, and junk, you inevitably have to do a lot of checking. Anyway, so what hands are mostly betting on the flop for the opponent, or for, for the low jack? It's going to be the hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. Aces, kings, ace, queen, king, queen, queen, jack. And then a smattering of bluffs. And notice here, the smattering of bluffs are kind of all over the place. Notice spades and hearts are betting more than the other hands. Like, take a look um, right down, look right in this region, okay? Notice here, we have ace two of spades and ace two of hearts, which are front door and back door flush draws betting a decent chunk, about half the time. And we have ace two and ace, ace two of clubs and diamonds checking most of the time, right? And that's because ace two of diamonds is trash. Now, a lot of people, they raise the ace-two of diamonds, and they get called, and they think, well, I have to bet it. I don't have anything. Well, let's see what happens if we do bet it. Notice it um, mixes it up with the bet sizes. Let's click we bet. Let's click we uh, check, because we're mostly going to check with ace-two of diamonds. We check. Opponent bets anything. Ace-two of diamonds folds. It raises every once in a while over a small bet. But if the opponent bets bigger, which they should not do, but say they do bet bigger, ace-two of diamonds is going to fold, right? So we can see very clearly when you check a hand like ace two of diamonds, it's to fold because you don't have anything. What about ace eight? Notice the ace eight of diamonds mostly checks. Let's say we check. Opponent bets small. Ace eight of diamonds mostly folds. It does call every once in a while against a tiny bet. But I want to make it clear that whenever we check with nothing, in most of these scenarios, we are mostly folding. We are going to be check raising sometimes, though, with good made hands and draws. So let's say we do check, because look, if you take a look at this, everything checks a large chunk of the time. And I'm not gonna say you should check everything in this scenario, but you should be checking this spot a lot. If you're against someone who's gonna bet 100% like uh, someone above in the chat said, then you definitely wanna check a lot because you can then check raise a ton. So let's say we do check. And now we see the player in position is supposed to bet kind of frequently and small, 50-50. Let's say they do bet. Before we take a look at what happens here. Which hands should they mostly be betting? Well, hands that are almost always good but vulnerable and draws. Anytime you're not betting, most of the time, you first start want to start betting with hands that are almost always good but vulnerable and then drawing hands. High equity draws and low equity draws. So let's just go through here and see if you're betting roughly half the time, which hands are we betting? Can we see what kind of cue he choose to bet the flop? I don't know what you mean. So take a look here. We have ace queen betting basically every time. King queen a lot. Queen jack. Some, queen 10, some, right? Queen nine, some. Don't queen nine over here. Queen eight, some, right? So top peers are betting a decent chunk of the time. Which drawing hands are betting? Notice we have stuff like king seven, all of them. You may say, is king seven a draw? King seven of diamonds, is that a draw? Well, if you think about it, king seven of spades and hearts is obviously a draw. King seven of diamonds has an overcard and a backdoor straight draw. So we have a very good draw with king seven of hearts, a pretty, I'm sorry, a very good draw with king seven of spades, a pretty good draw with king seven of hearts, and then a pretty trashy draw with king seven of diamonds because it has an overcard and a backdoor straight draw. Take a look at, um, interesting to see a lot of these betting almost the same amount of the time. I was going to say, there's going to be some of these where you see spades and hearts betting more than diamonds. And we do see, like right here, here's a good example. Notice here, spades and hearts. Well, spades at least is betting a lot more than diamonds, right? Spades is, ace five of spades is betting almost every time, whereas ace five of diamonds is only betting some. What about, uh, let's take a trashy one. Do we have a trashy one? About 10 and seven, eh, roughly the same. Anyway, you're gonna see these draws use a very mixed strategy and position, whereas most of the best hands are doing a decent amount of betting. Best hands that are vulnerable, right? Notice in this spot, we see sixes and fours betting every time. Sometimes you'll see sets slow playing, but almost never bottom and middle set. If we had top sets, they would do some slow playing, but we don't have any of those, obviously. Which hands really like to check for the player on the button? For those just arriving, we're discussing specifically low jack raises, 
Button calls 60 big blinds deep. We're looking at what happens after the low jack checks. Notice, pocket jacks does a lot of checking. Who's going to remember all of this poo? Ha ha ha. Sorry to not quote you 100% properly. I changed it twice. Um, you have to understand, you don't have to remember this. You have to remember the heuristics that come from this. You have to understand just a few somewhat simple rules to know how to play decently well in most spots. First things first, every hand is using a mixed strategy. That's important to know, right? And then you want to know which hands are more inclined to bet and which hands are more inclined to check. And as we see very clearly, ace queen bets a lot. Pocket jacks doesn't bet a lot. A lot of people think a queen and pocket jacks here are very similar, but they're not. Ace queen can get a ton of value from a lot of worse hands, like a queen or pocket jacks or whatever. Whereas jacks can get some value, but when you're against a queen, you're just torching your money. Okay? And you're going to find that with a hand like pocket jacks, you're almost always good, but you're vulnerable to being outdrawn. Click right here. Look at Range Explorer. Pocket jacks has 69% equity which is really high. 69% is really good, right? But if you bet and get called, it's pretty miserable. Or if you get raised, it's especially miserable. Now, one thing I will say is that when you bet in position in most scenarios, I don't think you are going to get raised nearly as often as the solver will recommend, which means you actually can bet wider for value. And you can bet wider with bluffs because you're going to realize your equity with your junkie bluffs a little bit better, right? You're going to find, though, that your bluffs are mostly going to come from kind of low equity hands. Like, notice here, king five. Remember how I showed king five is betting a lot and king seven is betting a lot? Notice how low equity these have. 20, you can see it. Well, I guess you can't see it slightly off the screen. Let's see. Um, that'll work. Notice here that uh, king seven, uh, you still can't see it. What is happening? How do I make it smaller? One second, one second. Can I make this any smaller? I cannot. Well, whatever. So let's pull this up here. You see King seven has 25% equity, which is really, really low. But that's a hand that doesn't mind betting because you do be, you are able to turn some additional draws. So if your population will not check raise enough, you can bet in position at a higher frequency with their value and draws. Correct. Because you're going to get to realize your equity with them far better. And notice here, you probably want to bet most of your queens against most people. When out of position online, you do a lot of checking to the preflop aggressor. Of course you should. Because you will rarely have the range and nut advantage. All right, back to over here. Notice here, we have a little bit of a range advantage, but not much of a nut advantage. Because we have no nut advantage, our, we're going to be using a small bet. Going to like, what can we learn from this? We don't have the nut advantage, meaning we don't have aces, kings, queens, and all the ace queens and all the king queens and all the queen jacks, right? And the opponent has a lot of them because remember, the opponent is checking some aces, some kings, some queens, a lot of ace queens, a lot of king queens. Some pocket sixes, some pocket fours. So we do not have a nut advantage. When you don't have the nut advantage, you don't get to bet big. That's something you can learn from this. Now, do you think you can remember that one simple thing? Do you think you can remember that one simple thing? Are you smart enough for that? Can you handle that one thing? When you don't have the nut advantage, bet small. That's something we've learned from this spot. And I've learned this from looking at thousands of spots. I think we can all handle that. I think literally every single person here, especially if you click the like button, can handle when you don't have the nut advantage, bet small. And you should be able to realize that we don't have the nut advantage on this board. So people ask, what can you learn from all this? How are you going to remember all this? Well, this is one thing you got to remember. Something else, Louis Philippe has already clearly laid out here, in position, when check to, you bet roughly half the time, which actually does hold true. 60, 40, 40, 60, whatever, you're going to be close. So notice we're check to, in this spot we're betting 54% of the time. Louis Philippe nailed it. Who'd have thought, the person who leads the study sessions, who's looked at probably more solver outputs than anybody else here, knows what he's talking about. Who'd have thought? Two things we've learned that are going to be very beneficial, right? You lack the nut advantage. When you bet, you bet small. And in position with check two, you bet something like half the time. And, you know, there's certainly going to be corner cases. There are going to be exceptions. But 
This is going to hold true in most scenarios. Interestingly enough, what happens if the low jack bets all their aces, kings, queens, jack, aces, kings, queens, ace, queen, king, queen, queen, jack, queen, ten? What if they bet every top pair and better? What's that do to their range if they check? Take a second, think about it. What's that do to their range if they check? If they bet all top pairs and better? As many people will do. Take a second, think about it. Well, that makes their range far weaker, right? They are capped, essentially, yes. It makes their range far weaker. So if their range is far weaker, now our nut advantage goes up, right? Because now they don't have aces and kings and queens, and ace, queen, and king, queen, and queen, jack. And now we do have ace, queen, king, queen, queen, jack, and we have the sets, and they're not going to have any sets because they would have bet those, right? So in that scenario, using a little bit of logic, we get to bet bigger. So you see, just by changing a few things, by making the opponent play poorly in ways that are predictable, you can use a little bit of logic to make adjustments. Now the question becomes, are you so confident to the point that you think you can figure out your opponent's specific strategy? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Depends on your opponent, right? Depends on the players in your game. But I would typically say most people in most scenarios on the flop bet too often with hands like queen 10. And to be fair, they probably just bet too often in general. When they check, they usually have something like jacks and worse and trash. If they have something like jacks and worse and trash, you can blast them. And that's going to put them in a really, really bad spot. How do you recognize between good players and bad players? By understanding the game theory optimal strategy. If you understand what the GTO strategy looks like and they don't play that way because you're observing them. For example, on this flop, if your opponent continuation bets out of position every time, that's a mistake, right? And you know they're not playing GTO because here we know they should be checking two thirds of the time. So if you see them making mistakes left and right, you now know they're probably not playing GTO. Now it might be a fine strategy against your particular opponents, but it's not GTO. And if they're not playing GTO, you can then use a little bit of logic to exploit them. New to the Twitch stream, welcome. Are we talking about out of position villain who continuation bets too high? Yes. So look, whenever we have this range that contains aces, if you want to think about which range we're talking about, if it has aces, that's the out of position player. In position player does not have aces. That's how you can easily tell here. Okay. Also says up here, out of position decision. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to the spot. We check. Opponent bets. Let's say we do decide to bet. Small. Notice here, when we bet, we're betting 1.7 big blinds on or into the one uh, 6.9 big blind pots. We're betting tiny here, like 25% pot. Louis Philippe gets another good heuristic here. Notice we're betting hands like ace two a lot and hands like ace 10, almost none. This has a flush draw. Why are we betting ace two more than ace 10? Well, the logic here is when you bet ace, 10, ace two, you get stuff like ace seven to fold. As we showed, right? Say we bet small here. Notice a7 does a lot of folding. That's good. That's good for us for making better hands fold. Notice if we bet ace10 though, literally no better hands fold. A lot of worse hands fold, but no better hands fold. Right? And you're going to see that we usually are betting somewhat polarized in position. This is a very common thing you'll see. You're betting polarized in most spots, to be fair. But you're betting polarized, especially in position where we're betting our best hands, as we saw, queens and better for the most part. And then hands that really benefit from the opponent folding that may have some equity. Like king five. When you bet king five, a whole lot of better stuff folds. When you bet nine, seven, a whole lot of better stuff folds, right? But notice the medium strength hands, like pocket jacks, pocket tens, pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sevens, they do a lot of checking. Also notice our sixes are going to do some checking, although over with over cards to do a lot of betting. Our bottom pair is going to do some checking, eh, you know, 50-50, whatever. Um, and then a lot of the ace highs are going to do checking. Notice ace king does a lot of checking, ace jack does a lot of checking, ace 10, and ace nine. The best ace highs. Essentially, in my mind, the way I view this is the hands kind of in the middle of the range that have showdown value. 
right? And you want to be checking hands that have showdown value. At this point, she's just trying to memorize these charts. Did you literally listen to what I just said? Come on, everybody. Turn on your listening ears. We're learning heuristics here. Medium strength hands are the ones that really prefer to check. Hands that can conceivably win at the showdown. That if they bet, do not get many better hands to fold. Those are the hands that really want to check. Which is why ace two bets more than ace ten. Right? Ace two bets more than ace ten because it does not have nearly as much showdown value as ace ten. But also, it gets better stuff to fold. Can we mix in a bet against an aggressor who checks in order to steal on a dry board? Can't. You can do whatever you want. You get to make your own decisions. We're discussing specifically this spot today. But your bets are usually going to be with good hands and junk. You're checking your marginal hands for the most part, using a somewhat mixed strategy. All right, let's say we do bet. Now, take a second. Think about this. So what vary a6? Mm. I don't know what you're talking about a6. a6 is a pair. a6 has a lot of showdown value. Um, a oh, why bet a6 if it has some showdown? a6 is a good hand. a6 has a lot of equity. You can go back over to this range explorer thing. You'll see a6 has pretty good equity. So if you look at the hands that do a lot of betting, it's going to be like middle pairs and better some portion of the time, right? The hands that are like 50% equity don't do a lot of betting. I'm not even looking at this thing. I don't even know which hands have 50% equity. Let's just take a look, see if that's right. Which hands have 50% equity? Oh my God, we found them. Ace Jack checks literally every time and it has about 50% equity. Ace 10, checking every time has about 50% equity. Ace 9, same thing, right? What about pocket 7s, pocket 8s, pocket 9s, right? I mean, these are obviously pretty good, but you really don't want to bet and get raised with a hand like Jack's. Um, pocket threes probably doesn't do a ton of betting, right? Does pocket threes do a lot of betting? Not really, right? So you're going to see that the hands that have, you know, 45 to 55% equity really don't like to bet. Right? And notice, ace eight, ace six, ace six suited in the spot actually has pretty good equity. Again, notice all these are very mixed strategies. I want to make it super clear. You're, you're mixing it up with everything. I'm just trying to show you which hands really like to check and which hands really like to bet. That we can start seeing, all right, if I got this hand, I probably need to bet it every time. Like you get ace queen here, you probably need to bet it every time, right? Also, flush draws bet a lot, right? Notice a lot of these ace high flush draws are betting. That said, they don't bet every time. You may ask, why do you not bet every flush draw? Why do you not want to bet with every flush draw? Because if you bet with a flush draw, you can call if you get raised every time, right? How do you live with yourself after making a bad river call? What do you mean? We're playing a children's card game here. You get mad whenever you're playing a children's card game. You need to work on your mindset. All right. Why do we not bet every flush draw? Well... We don't want to bet every flush draw because if we bet with every flush draw and a flush card comes, what does that mean when we check? Well, it means when it goes check, check, and a flush comes, we have no flushes. And that's a big problem. You want to make sure that we have some flushes in all points in our range when we both bet and check, right? When we bet and a flush comes, we want to be able to have some flushes. When we check and the flush comes, we want to be able to have some flushes. Otherwise, one way or the other, if we, let's say, we bet them every time, when we do check and the flush comes, we don't have any flushes. And now all the opponent has to do to crush us is just blast it and blast it because we completely lack the nut advantage. When you completely lack the nut advantage, your opponent can use big bets and make you indifferent between call and folding, which wins them the pot on average, which is a big problem. What if we check every flush draw? Well, if we let it go check, check, and the flush comes, we have a ton of flushes. But what about when it doesn't? Well, now we have a bunch of unpaired cards that have a draw. Then the opponent can just blast us and blast us, and they win, right? So you want to make sure that you don't play every hand in the same manner in most scenarios. And you're going to find that draws, like flush draws, basically never bet every time unless you're betting with almost everything. Everyone's being much nicer to the question of how do you live with yourself after making a bad river call? I mean, look, it happens. You're going to make bad calls all the time. And what do you mean by bad? 
In my mind, bad means it's like clearly bad from a GTO point of view. I made a mistake the other day in a $25,000 buy-in tournament. You're not going to believe this, man. We were like 30 big blinds deep or something, okay? Good, loose, aggressive. Eh, I'm not going to say loose, aggressive, but good, good GTO player. Raised in the cutoff. I had queen nine suited on the button. Maybe getting stacked slightly off here. Let me pull up my handy dandy chart on my phone to make sure I'm not getting this preflop spot wrong because I got it right preflop. I got it right preflop. I got, got a little bit of it right at least. Let's see. GTO preflop. Third big blinds deep. Button versus raise from cut off. Yeah, queen nine suited. 100% call. Okay? Yeah. Okay, we got that part right. We're roughly 30 big blinds deep. I may be getting the hand slightly wrong. If you do not have the poker coaching app, you should get it. We have tons and tons of preflop spots available for you. So you don't screw up preflop. Guy raise, I call. We're not anywhere near the money. Um, 10, 9, 3 or something like that. 10, 9, 3. With one heart. He bets, I call. Maybe there are no hearts. Let's pretend like there's no hearts to make it worse for me. Here's how our flush draws play, by the way. Thank you, Louis Philippe. 10-9-3. Um, the opponent bet, kind of big, which they probably should do on a polarized board or on a uh, dynamic board. Maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, I called. And right there, my good friend, Justin Sleva, just GTO ran the spot, and he immediately recognized this might be a fold. I was like, what? You want me to fold the queen nine on the 10-9-3? And it turns out, I'm supposed to fold that hand like two thirds of the time. Queen nine on 10, nine, three. Probably no flush, no backdoor flush draw. I can't imagine you're supposed to fold this with a backdoor flush draw. He must have used a big bet as well. So if he used a big bet, I'm supposed to fold the queen, ten, queen nine on the 10, nine, three. Fine. Turn comes. It's a, it puts up a flush draw or two, maybe two flush draws or something. I don't, I don't remember the exact spot. I'm sorry. Um, not my flush draw, obviously. And then I think he like, ripped it all in. Like a, an overbet. So it must have been two flush draws. This is a good GTO opponent. He must have ripped it in on the two flush draw board. And I called, thinking, you know, I beat all the draws. Obviously, queen's not great because uh, I block queen jack and whatnot. But whatever, I called. And I thought it was a pretty easy call. Turns out it's a horribly bad call. Torched my equity. It's like a horribly bad call, but it's pretty bad. It's definitively a fold. It's a fold because uh, we lose to all the opponent's good hands and all of his draws have equity. And I, I block king, queen, queen jack, right? So how did I live with myself? Well, first thing first, I was too naive to even realize I screwed up. I did show it with Justin because I know Justin can run these spots quickly. He already has a gigantic database of all the spots. So he ran it quickly and told me pretty quickly that, hey, you screwed up. <laughs> how do you live with yourself, especially when you torch your money? Well, you realize sometimes you're going to mess up. You want to make sure that you're at least learning from the scenario. I don't feel so bad about it because, look, first things first, if I lost some money, it was like a thousand bucks in equity. It happens. Sometimes you're going to lose some money. And also, I learned from it. Ran the spot, learned the scenario, realized on these um, two, flush two flush draw boards, you should not call off perhaps quite as wide as I thought, or at least in that exact scenario. It turns out the queen nine is a particularly bad hand to have, which I knew, I knew it was not a good hand to have, but I thought the opponent might be over bluffing a little. And I thought, uh, thought the hand was better than it was, right? And so you learn. You learn and you move on. You learn and grow. That's exactly right. That is how you live yourself whenever you make a bad call. And also you have to realize, like, is your bad call actually bad? Like, say you have 20 big lines and you get it all in with kings preflop and your opponent has aces. Did you make a bad call? Obviously not, right? You should be far more concerned in spots where you're playing kind of far from the solver, especially against good players. What is queen nine suited blocking? Yeah, it blocks bluffs. It blocks the uh, the queen jack and the queen nine, uh, queen jack, queen eight, king queen. Right? What did he have? Uh, Ace-10, I think, which is fine hand to play. So he busted me, and I lost, and that's such his life, right? It doesn't really matter what he had. It doesn't matter what he have has if he shows up with some ridiculous bluff. Like, say he shows up with whatever, like Ace-2 of diamonds or something absurd. Then it matters. But if he shows up with an obvious hand to play in that manner, like Ace-10, then it doesn't matter so much. Anyway, here's how you play flush draws. Notice they're betting sometimes and checking sometimes, right? You're mainly concerned with the actual flush draws, I think, in this spot. Not so much with the backdoor flush draws. So look at the look at these up here, right? So anyway, 
Let's say we do bet small. Okay, let's get back on track. You all are sidetracking me. Let's say we get back on track. Where do you see the cards we have? We have our whole range. That's what I'm trying to teach all of you here. We are discussing how to play our whole range. And if you have, let's say, Ace-10 suited here, what we want to look at is if you did have the Ace-10 suited for Ace-10 of hearts here, you should basically never bet it. Why? Because you do not benefit from folding out any better hands if you do bet. You have a little bit of showdown value, and your hand has, you know, 45-ish to 50-ish percent equity. So it's a great hand to check. Anyway, let's say we do bet small. What I want you to think about now is how often should the flop checking range here by the way, see how they play their flush draws here? Also a lot of mixing, right? How often should this low jacks range be check raising? For everybody who's late, welcome. This is a scenario, 60 big blinds deep, where low jack raises, button calls, flop comes, queen, six, four, two spades. We're discussing first low jack checks. As you see, they should do about two thirds of the time. And now we're gonna look at what happens when the button bets small. How often should they be getting check raised? Louis Philippe, I love how you tell me what to point out. It makes my life easy. When we are betting here, it's going to be a lot of hands with a spade, right? Ace of spades, king of spades are always going to be the spades that do a lot of betting. Um, the weaker spades are not going to do as much betting, I presume. Actually, it looks like they are betting some because they lack showdown value, I guess. Like Jack-10 really benefits from getting ace high and king out of fold, so it does bet a lot. Notice, though, uh, when you... What am I... What's happening here? Notice here, take a look at this chart. When you have the ace of spades, you do a lot of betting. Can you see that in the down down there? Down there. You see the ace of spades, ace ten of spades does. Can I do it like this? Yeah. Notice ace ten of spades. Ace, I'm sorry, ace of spades, ten of ten of X does a lot of betting. Whereas um the ones without spades don't do much betting at all, right? And that's because these ones with spades can get there with backdoor flush sometimes, and they get turns that they can continue barreling on a lot. Whereas these don't get it very often at all, right? Notice without a heart also basically never bets. With heart bets a little bit. Same thing's gonna be true for like king. Uh, let's actually look at ace jack, obviously same thing. What about ace king, same thing. Notice the ace of spades and king of spades really likes to bet. What about jack 10? Jack 10 looks like it's kind of all over the place, but even still the spades bet far more often than the not spades, right? Notice nines. Nines with a spade is going to bet far more often than nines without a spade. All right? Tens, jacks, same thing. With a spade bets more often without a spade because with a spade, you can randomly make a flush. You typically bet the hands that have equity over the hands that don't have equity or the hands that have less equity. Okay, let's get back to the topic. We have all sorts of check raising sizes. 15%, 20%, 20%, 55%. That's a little high. 30%, 20%. Let's see. Small bet. We are raising about 17% of the time. Okay. So just to be very clear, in this spot, pot with 6.9 big blinds on the flop. Low jack checks, button bets 1.7. Low jack now, in this spot, when they raise, they're usually either raising to 5.8, two and a half times the opponent's bet, or 8.9. Okay. So we see the solver is mixing between these two sizes. In this scenario, if you just want to make it like seven big blinds, eight big blinds, whatever, I think it's fine. Notice though, solver really does like small raises. When you raise small, it really does put your opponent in a nasty spot. You can tell the size because it says raise to 58. This means raise to 58, just to be clear. So they bet 1.7, we make it 5.8 or 8.9, right? Notice we're never ripping it in. And if we gave it 12, it would not use 12 very often either. Okay, lots of calling. Almost no folding, 25% folds. Notice what we are folding. We're folding only the trash, right? We're only folding trash, right? You can hover over this and see the hands that we are folding. It's all the stuff with like literally no draws, right? Hearts don't fold a ton unless they have two under cards, right? Do you raise in relation to the villain's bet or as a percentage of the pot? You raise uh, smaller when the opponent bets bigger. 
I know we don't have a good example here because the opponent should not be betting big. Let's say they did bet 4.1 though. You're going to see our raise sizes are smaller. Notice when we do raise over a 4.1 bet, it's to 10. So 2.5x, right? And notice against the bigger bet, we fold a whole lot more, 42%. Against the small bet though, which is the obvious GTO size, we are raising, our small raise is to, uh, let me do math, 3x the amount, and our bigger raise is slightly bigger. But you saw as we were facing a bigger bet, we basically never use a 3x, 4x, 5x check raise. Also notice we can't fold that often at all. So this is where a lot of people get lost. They have a hand like ace-10 of diamonds. And they're in this situation. And they know they see a hand like ace-10 of diamonds call sometimes. Kind of an annoying spot, right? Ace-10 of diamonds, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, in this scenario, we should probably fold. Now, I see very clearly Solver says to call it 62% of the time. You can see the 62% right here. Yeah, you see the 62%, 63%? And fold, it's off the screen for you, but 33. We're folding 33, calling 62, raising a sprinkle. Um, I don't think you need to raise a sprinkle pretty much ever with the ace, 10 of diamonds. I think, I think you can completely ignore that. Life will be okay. And you have to realize in these spots, when we are calling, our equity is not great. It's basically a neutral spot. So in neutral spots, especially if you think your opponents are going to keep betting the turn a little bit too often, as I think a lot of people do after betting the flop, you should be very inclined to fold because you're going to under-realize your equity. Because let me show you what happens if we do call. Say we do call. Turn is whatever, three of clubs. We're going to check everything because now we completely lack the range advantage. We check everything. Let's say the opponent bets again. Three of clubs, kind of fun. They, they're they actually supposed to over-bet. <laughs> Let's say they pot it. Now notice ace-10 of diamonds is just going to fold every time, right? So the question becomes, should we call the ace-10 to begin with? And the answer is, if the opponent's not going to keep betting the turn often enough, if they're going to be very inclined to check, then we can just check and call down very clearly, right? So let's say we do, uh, they bet small, we call. Say the turns are three of clubs, they check, check, check. Now the river's whatever, like a seven of, let me make it nine of clubs. All right, we see ace 10 still is just trying to check and trying to get to showdown, right? Why is it trying to get to the showdown? Uh, that's not what I want. I wanted... Am I clicking the wrong button? I don't know what the button is to click here. I'm bad at this. Um, oh, here we are. Ace-10 has 31% equity. Turns out, 31% equity is some. Notice the hands that are betting on the river in our scenario are gonna be very low equity hands. Take a look at these hands in red. Let's see if I can pull this over here. Take a look at the hands in red. King seven. King seven bets every time. King eight. King eight bets every time. King nine. I'm sorry, king nine's a pair. King 10 bets every time. King jack bets every time. So notice here, the hands that are the lowest equity typically are the ones that bluff a lot, especially if, they, if there are no super relevant blockers. And right here on this board, there's not a ton of super relevant blockers. You'd rather, um, suppose, not have spades in your hand because you want your opponent to have spades. But notice hands like ace-10 and ace-jack have far more equity in the hand, like king-jack. And the way you can kind of think about this is king-jack and king-10, when you bet, get better hands to fold. So when you can get better stuff to fold, that's really when you want to be bluffing. Like notice eight, eight seven has 1% equity. One. 1% <laughs> 1 equity hand is betting every time. Because it cannot, it cannot win by checking. Okay? So that's kind of how you want to think about these spots. So with this ace-10, we're just trying to check. And again, so you can think about this two different ways. One is you have no equity and no showdown value, which is why you'd want to bluff with some of the garbage. But at the same time, you get better hands to fold by betting. That's, I think, the way you are really supposed to be thinking about it. Um, so anyway, let's say we do check the ace-10. Opponent checks it back and we win. Great. Notice the stuff they're checking back sometimes. Ace-5, Ace-2, Ace-7, Ace-8, King-7 even sometimes. Right? King-Jack sometimes. They're supposed to be doing a decent amount of checking in this spot. And so by checking with this Ace-10, we actually win this a lot. And if your opponent's going to be even more inclined to check now with their weaker stuff, 
Like say they are sitting here with the king seven and the king eight and they just never bluff it. That's obviously really good for our ace 10. Because on the river, if we do check and they do bet the uh, king eight, what size they use? They use mostly pot. Ace 10 is going to be folding most of the time, right? So, as your opponent is going to take aggressive actions more often, you typically don't want to be calling with weak bluff catchers immediately on the flop. Again, something else we can learn just by easily looking at this. Now, I will say, if the opponent's betting too often, their range is going to be too bluff heavy, presumably. Although they could just be betting with more value hands too. And that does convolute stuff because maybe ace 10 becomes good enough to just check, call, check, call, check, call, and win. But we saw you had 30-something percent equity which is usually when you don't want to be finding calls. By the way, we saw that ace-10 had 30-something percent equity. I don't know how much equity he had against the opponent's betting range, but facing a pot-sized bet, if you're going to win one-third of the time, you should call with some portion of the time, right? What if you're betting into a calling station who won't fold? What do you think? Trash can player with a Prime sub. Thank you. If you all have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to any Twitch streamer you want one time per month for free. And Amazon kindly gives a streamer $2.50 just for fun. So, if you're an Amazon Prime member, which I know a lot of people are, I have literal Amazon bags right here in my in my office. If you're an Amazon Prime member, give your 250 to a Twitch streamer. It doesn't have to be me. Give it to somebody else. First time, instantly new. This is great stuff. Well, thank you. We do this every Monday whenever I'm at home. Monday, Wednesday, or every Monday, uh, 9, 9 a.m. Eastern. And we also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pokercoaching. Check it out. Quite often, whenever people ask, what do you do against a calling station who won't fold? The answer should be kind of obvious. If your opponent won't fold, bluff less, value bet more. Going back to the flop. Remember how I said right off the bat, it's probably not a bad strategy for most people in most games to bet ace-queen, king-queen, queen-jack every time on the flop. Out of position. Why? Because most people don't fold quite enough and most people don't bet quite enough on the flop. Let's go back to the initial question. You all keep sidetracking me. On the flop, low jack checks, button bet small. What should low jack raise and to what size? Kevin, good morning. You're here about 90% of Mondays. I think you're here like 100% of Mondays. You must have nothing going on on Monday morning. That's good, I'm glad you're here. Take a look at what wants to raise. Using some logic, in a spot where we are not favored, we want to be raising with our best hands, some high equity draws, and some low equity draws. Let's see if that's accurate. This is a heuristic. Heuristic means like a, a rule that mostly applies in most spots. Um, does it does is that what we're actually doing? So, what are our best hands that are almost always vulnerable, and what are our lo low equity draws and high equity draws? Our best hands that are vulnerable are obviously aces, kings, and ace queen. Aces check raises almost every time. Ace king check raises almost every time. Lou said he had no clue about the 12 Twitch subs per year. Yeah, 12 per year, one a month. You have to do it You have to do it manually every time. It does not auto-renew you. They make it tough. But if you're there anyway, you might as well just click the, click the subscribe button and give away your 250, right? Aces, kings, ace, queen. Check raise a lot. King, queen, check raises some. Notice uh, the weaker hands, though, like queen, eight, right? Queen, eight, check raises none. Why is queen, eight, check raising none? And why is ace, queen, check raising a lot? When I say a lot, by the way, not every time. From out of position, you're going to be using very mixed strategies, meaning you're check-raising some, check-calling some. Well, Queen-8 can get called by a whole lot of... Um, Queen-8 cannot get called by quite as much stuff as Ace-Queen does. When you check-raise Ace-Queen and your opponent has a Queen, you are going to get a value from a lot of worse Queens, right? When you check-raise the Queen-8, well, you're going to get called by all the better Queens and you're going to lose money. So Aces, Kings, and Ace-Queen check-raise a ton. Say we do check raise. Everybody's gonna already ask this. I can already feel it coming. By the way, use bigger sizes with these hands typically, which is why I said if you want to just size it up a little bit here, I think it's probably fine because this is most of your value check raising range. Anyway, say we do raise and we get called and the turns uh two of clubs. Notice aces, kings, and ace, queen. Keep betting. We're loading our money in. Notice in this spot, we're potting it usually. Why are we potting it usually here? Because we have the best hand most of the time, and the board is very draw heavy. I do realize there's a random 5-3 available, but it's actually not because the opponent doesn't have it, right? I don't think they have it, at least. So, in this spot, the 2 came, it completed a straight, but it, the straight is irrelevant, or close enough to irrelevant to where you can ignore it. If it was like a 
eight or something, or a, a, yeah, if it was like an eight or a three, then you have to be way more concerned about the straight. Okay, so now in this spot, we're gonna keep betting. Say opponent calls, river comes, whatever. Say it's a eight. Notice aces and kings are still just loading the money in every time. Ace, queen, mostly two. So when you check raise this spot, 60 big blinds deep with aces, kings, and ace, queen, you are trying to play for all the money. If we do check and the opponent does go all in, ace, queen calls. We're checking ace, queen because you want to make sure you're protecting your checking range some. Notice we do fold a lot to the big bet on the river, but you want to make sure you do protect your calling range. This is a weird spot on the river because our calling range is kind of weak, but that's fine because we're extracting a lot of value when we bet. When you're super duper polarized, as we are when we check raise the flop and bet the turn and bet the river, when we check the river, you do want to protect your range some, but you will find some weird spots where you're like check folding 90% of the time. That's because you're extracting so much value with your betting range and the checking range is a very small frequency to the point you don't have to worry about protecting it so much. And that's a weird spot. Don't even worry about that. Anyway, <laughs> um, we see like ace queen's just not folding here. So when you do check raise, ace queen or king queen, notice king queen's just not folding. If you had queen jack, it's just not folding. We had queen 10, it's not folding. We had queen nine. Not folding. These hands are good enough to stack off against someone who is good. Let's go all the way back here, though. Okay, say we do face of 1.7 bet. Which hands rate? Oh, we want to look at the draws now. Scroll through here. Let's look at the spades. Notice here, which hands are check raising? So now we're only looking at hands with a spade, okay? Notice the ace high flush draws don't actually check raise all that often. Whereas the weaker flush draws kind of do at least more than the ace high, which is always interesting to see. You're gonna find that the ace high flush draw really doesn't do a whole lot of check raising. And I think that's because when you re-raise and get jammed, it's pretty rough, but also you don't benefit from getting a whole lot of better hands to fold, right? When we check raise ace jack of spades and we get called, we're behind. It's not so ideal. Louis Fleet points out king five and king seven of spades check raises way more than king jack. Same story, right? They all have a bit of backdoor straight draws, but King Jack lacks showdown value. But it has the one over card. The one over card is actually really valuable um, because when you do check raise and get called, you have outs, right? Well, to be fair, you have outs with Ace Jack too, but in the spot, the King High gets Ace Highs to fold. What else is raising? Notice stuff like King 10 offsuit is raising. So hands that really like to raise in these spots have. Straight draws around the queen. So like king, jack, king, 10. Um, and they want to overcard a lot. So we see the king is check raising a pretty good chunk of the time. Do you host seminars? I have a training site called pokercoaching.com. I only have about 20,000 hours of content there with a whole lot of other coaches who I've hand selected. So make sure you check it out. So anyway, you see stuff like King 10 does a lot of check raising too. So you ask which draws are raising high equity draws, like flush draws and low equity draws. What are low equity draws on this board? It's going to be stuff like King 10 with a spade, right? King 10 with a spade is an obvious check raise. What other hands would like to check raise here sometimes? You may think hands like 8-7, but eh, not so much. We do see 8-7 check raises some 4% of the time without a flush draw, 5%, yeah, 4% of the time without a flush draw. I'm sorry, that's wrong. 10% of the time without a flush draw. So some, some real number. So I wouldn't mind mixing it in. If we add seven, five, that might be one. Although the thing is you have to be careful raising. Say we do raise, oh, I clicked the wrong button. Say we do raise and then we get re-raised. This is what a lot of people fear. They think that, oh man, if I raise a flush draw, I'm gonna get re-raised off my hand. But look, if your opponent's good, they should never re-raise you. Why is the opponent never re-raising when you check raise them on the flop if they're good? Even though my range has a lot of draws in it. My range. The low jacks range has a lot of draws in it. Why should the button basically never re-raise if the low jacks range has a lot of draws in it? Take a second. Think about it. They even have okay equity. Actually, they don't have good equity. They're in, they're in pretty rough shape. <laughs> My brain's broken over here, everyone. I keep thinking 38% to 100. 38% to a 144. Actually, in very bad shape. That's the answer. They're in terrible shape. 
The opponent is in terrible shape. Why are they in terrible shape? Because they have a whole lot of junk, right? All these hands in blue are just trash. And a lot of these other hands, like middle pair, are crushed by the opponent's range, right? They're crushed in this scenario because the opponent's range contains a lot of high equity draws, which are good, good made hands, which are good, and then some trashy draws that get to mix in the bluffs. So anyway, in the spot, when they get raised, they have to call basically everything. You say you want them to keep barreling. You don't want them to keep barreling when you have the pocket eights. Let's say we do call and the turns are two of clubs and they bet again, as they should do for 1.5x pot. Let's just do pot. We'll do pot to make life easy. Notice pocket eights now folds. You really wanted to keep barreling with you're just gonna fold all your hands? Notice whenever they barrel the turn, you have to fold a lot. Third of the time. So you fold a lot on the flop. You, well, you fold some on the flop. You fold the turn a lot. Say we do call, now the river's whatever, eight of clubs, and they bet again. They put you all in. You still fold a lot. Look, some queens fold on this river. <laughs> you really want them barreling if you're gonna be folding out top pair? Not really. What if they bet small on the river? Obviously gotta call all your queens. Fun to see some raises mixing it in now. King queen's good enough to raise? Yeah, that feels dirty. But anyway, you see, you're still folding a lot, right? Pocket sevens fold some, fives fold. But you see, you're not calling because you want them to keep barreling. You're calling because you're smashed by their raising range. When they raise you, you are crushed by the most likely hands they have. Ace is kings and ace queen, right? You're absolutely crushed. And their draws have good equity. So that forces you to not re-raise very often. Now, some people will re-raise because they don't know what they're doing. You give them the king queen, they'll just jam it in your face. Luckily, if they jam king queen, your life's pretty easy. You just call whenever you smash them. Okay, let's say we do raise, they do call, turns to two of clubs. We keep betting a lot. One thing you will learn is that when you check raise and your range is good and polarized, if the turn does not help their range, you keep betting very, very often. Now here we're actually checking half the time, which, you know, whatever. You may think that this is not betting very often, but betting half the time is, is kind of often. This is the spot where we're gonna keep betting all of our good made hands and our draws, some high equity, some low equity. Going back to the spades, notice we are still checking some spades. We start to give up though with the real trash draws. Like notice king of spades 10 did not improve at all and now it gives up. Actually all these unpaired hands mostly give up, right? Here try control H, oh boy, what's control H do? Control H doesn't do anything. Maybe I need to unclick this, control H, ah, whatever. Louis Philippe, you're too complicated for me. Pio genius, if you wanna learn from uh, Pio from Louis Philippe, who knows Pio way better than me, get in the Poker Coaching Study Session. It starts right after this. Go to pokercoaching.com, click in the Discord, and uh, click in the Study Session tab. There you go. Let's say instead the turn's a spade. Now, we're still gonna bet decently often, but now when we do bet, we're gonna bet smaller. When the turn is what is referred to as uh, a turn that does not keep a lot of draws on the board, when there's now some super nuts that unli that's unlikely to get outdrawn on the river, then you're gonna be using small bets mostly. So let me show you, nine of clubs, notice we're mostly using big bets, only pot and over pot. Nine of spades, we're gonna be using mostly small bets. When the board is dynamic, meaning it's very likely to change on the next betting round, in those spots, you bet, uh, you bet big. In spots where there's, when the board's static, meaning, the board's very unlikely to change for whatever the effective nut hands are. In those scenarios, you bet small. Okay? It's another thing you can learn. People ask, what can you learn? How are you supposed to memorize all this? I've only told you like five things to remember so far, and they're very important. <laughs> all right. Say um, in this spot, what are we betting with? Let's see what we're doing with our spades. Notice with flushes on the turn. Pay attention to these areas up here. With flushes on the turn, we're betting sometimes and checking sometimes. Again, you want to make sure from out of position you're using very mixed strategies. Notice with aces. Aces with a spade bets far more than aces without a spade, right? Aces with a spade bet about two thirds of the time, ace, or three fourths of the time. Aces with a spade bet, with no spade bet half the time. Same thing for kings, I'm sure. Ace queen, mixing it up. Notice ace queen can just go for value here. Say you do bet small with ace queen, and the opponent raises. Ace queen lets it go, unless it has a spade. A lot of people hate this. They hate the idea of betting the turn with ace-queen and getting raised and then having to fold. The thing is, though, is that when you bet the turn and get raised, 
I'm sorry, when you bet the turn and get called, ace queen is crushing your opponent's calling range. Let's say we do bet the opponent calls. Rivers whatever two of clubs. Notice ace queen. Oh, look at their calling range. Ace queen smashes this. Notice the opponent does slow play a lot of their spades, by the way. They don't do a whole lot of raising. Opponent slow plays, lots of flushes. Notice the flushes they like to raise are the ones that are most vulnerable to being outdrawn, or at least a lot of them that are vulnerable to being outdrawn. Right in here, right? So when we bet and they call us, we are smashing their calling range with ace-queen, which is why you can value bet it. And if you do get called and the river's a blank, you can shove it, or at least value bet it for river on the river. Too deep stack to shove here. Okay? So hands like ace-queen are good enough to go for it. What else should we look at? I think it's time for Louis Sleep Fleet study session. I'm not going to delay him. When they check raise the river, do we fold? Depends on with what hand. What do you mean? Say we get the nine of spades. When they check raise the river. I'm not even sure what you mean here. Say we get the nine of spades, we check. Now the opponent, when they bet, they're not going to bet too big, I don't think. They do They do use pot size. That's kind of cool. They pot. We call. River's a two of clubs. We check. I got to imagine they're only going to shove, right? Yeah, so they only shove because they only have a pot size left. So they cannot check raise the river. They cannot check... Uh, the low jack cannot check raise the river because the low jack has, or because we're only pot size deep. In position player, here's one more thing. In position player on the river, when they have a pot size bet or less, they almost always all in or check. You don't want to bet a small bet because when you make small bets for value and get raised, then you are in a in different spot for a lot of money, which is usually not where you want to be. So you either shove or you check. Um, notice though, hands that do shove include. Some bluffs. Eight, seven of diamonds. Ooh, dirty bird getting a bluff through with the eight, seven of diamonds. Pocket eights. Bluffs it on the river. Pocket nines. Bluffs it on the river. Oh, pocket nines is not a bluff. What am I saying? Pocket eights, pocket fives, pocket threes. Does some bluffing on the river. Kind of cool to see. Ace 10 with a spade. Loves bluffing on the river. Ace jack with a spade. Loves bluffing on the river. All in if we found ourselves there. A lot of people don't bluff the river nearly often enough. It's certainly a leak people have. Anyway, let's say the river's two of clubs. We do bet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Check, 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 bet, call. Okay, so yeah, that's that. Anyway, we went through a lot of spots today. I'm out of time. I hope you have a great day. I'm sorry I didn't go through lots and turns of river scenarios here, but I think we learned how to play the flop pretty well and the turn pretty well. And if you let me know if you like this kind of walkthrough where we go through a particular spot, let me know. It's good for me, too. You all teach me how to become a Pio expert. <laughs> and we all improve together. Thank you all very much for being here. I hope you have a great day. I hope you learn a ton from Louis Philippe's study session happening right now in the Poker Coaching Discord. And I hope we all work to improve each other's life. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate all of you. Click the like and subscribe buttons below. Check out PokerCoaching.com. This is Pio Solver. If you like this kind of thing, let me know. Click the like button. If we get 16,000 likes, I'll be sure to do another one in the future. Maybe fewer. We'll see. Thank you all for being here. I'll talk to all of you next time.